uh, we will be talking about cancer, uh, where we are today, where we're going, uh, is it going to get better, uh, is it going to get worse. Uh, and with us is Dr. DePino, uh, who I will not subsequently refer to as Ron, probably because I've mispronounced his first name. Uh, he was for many years at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, the same place I uh, trained, and uh, has recently moved to be uh, president and CEO uh, at MD Anderson in Houston, Texas, certainly one of the nation's treasures in terms of uh, cancer work. Uh, Ron and I are going to talk for about uh, half an hour, and then we're going <coughs> to open it up uh, to your questions. So one of the big issues is, are we doing better or worse in the war on cancer? Well, it's a mixed story. Uh, first of all, we only recently understood what cancer is, what the major instigators are, and that information is now being exploited systematically to help drive mortality down. So over the last 20 years, there has been a 20% decline in cancer mortality at the same time that cancer incidence has increased. And this is really where the problem is. Why is don't that, you explain what cancer incidence is to the... So that, that is the, the uh, number of new cases that come on that are diagnosed with a particular disease. So that's the incidence of the disease. And so we have uh, well north of a million new cases per year. By 2030, it's expected to go up uh, to 2.5 million in the United States because of one major factor, and that is the changing demographics. After the age of 60, there's an exponential increase in the incidence of age-related diseases, Alzheimer's, diabetes, heart disease, and cancer. And so every five years, essentially, those diseases double in incidence, culminating in a one in three chance if you're a woman, or a one in two chance if you're a man to have that disease by the age of 80. For Alzheimer's, it's a 45% chance by the time you're 85. So what we have now is this changing demographics and rise in incidence of disease solely driven by changing demographics. So the baby boom is really going to cause a big rise in cancer. Uh, but on the other hand, the sort of proportion of people who die from cancer has stayed relatively flat. Is actually going down in terms, it's 20% decline over the last two decades. And still but about uh, north of half a million people a year, are 550 are dying of cancer. Are still. succumbing to the disease. And uh, it's important to appreciate if you were going to try to deal with this problem that it's not simply about advanced disease, which is where most of the dialogue is. It's about prevention, detection, and treatment. And so when you think about each of those areas, the opportunities for really driving mortality still further downward is great. 50% of cancers can be preventable. If you catch certain cancers early, the impact on mortality statistics is staggeringly different. And then with advanced disease, we're now learning a lot more about what makes those particular cancers tick and are trying to address the root causes of those cancers. And all of the advances in each of those areas have impacted on the mortality so incidence. Let's go back. Why is it when you get older, you're more likely to get cancer? Uh, what in the biology increases your chances so dramatically? So the very circuitry that precipitates the aging process, which is a, uh, an axis of evil, which is uh, DNA accumulation of DNA damage uh, that occurs over time, coupled with a circuit that ties into the powerhouse of your cell, your mitochondria, which also is very important for regulating free radicals. What happens with aging is that you reach a threshold of damage or dysfunction in, those, in that axis, and you get a feed-forward cycle which drives the aging process. So we do very well as a species, and then in the last year of life, we plummet physiologically because we get into this feed forward cycle. What cancer has done is cancer has taken that very same pathway and commandeered it, has mutated it in a way that is it is no longer responsive to those senescent cues and instead maintains the DNA in a state that's good for the cancer cell, maintains the energy status of the cell, and maintains the free radical status of the cancer cell in a way that's permissive for the immortal state that typifies cancer. 
And that, those, that DNA damage just increases as we get older. Right, and exactly. And makes, actually, there is a, a Nobel Prize was given out just a couple of years ago for where most of the damage occurs. At the tips of your chromosomes are these structures known as telomeres. And telomeres are inert structures are like the caps on your shoelaces that help maintain the integrity of the chromosome. And so they're designed to repel DNA repair machinery because you don't want to repair the end because the ends of chromosomes would then fuse to one another. So they're actually designed to repel repair processes. So over time, they serve as a reservoir for the accumulation of damage that occurs at those tips. Eventually, you reach a threshold of damage that then precipitates the aging process. What have cancer cells done? They actually uh, reawaken an enzyme that can now repair and synthesize new telomeres, new tips, to rejuvenate and maintain the immortal state of cancer cells. So uh, one of the reasons that we've had, uh, or correct me if I'm wrong, but one of the reasons we've had this decline in cancer, this 20% decline in cancer deaths, is really about lung cancer, isn't it? And it's about a tremendous change we've had in our society in terms of prevention. Uh, there are some other cancers that we've learned to cure, some that we've learned to actually treat and prevent from coming back, like breast cancer. Well, here again, it's a bit of a mixed bag. So it is true that as a nation, we've gone from about 40% smokers to about 19%. That has had a profound impact on the incidence of lung cancer, bladder cancer, head and neck cancer, and so on. And so that is a major driver. So that has helped a great deal. And that has been part of it. Uh, the other is the screening. So uh, a colonoscopy, for example. Uh, skin surveillance. These are all things that catch cancers at a point where they are largely curable. That has had a pretty significant impact. And in my view, we're not doing enough at the front end with respect to prevention and screening. And there are a lot of things beyond colonoscopy, et cetera, that we could be doing uh, as a nation to really drive and exploit uh, the opportunities there. But then it's also in the therapeutic area. And there have been some game-changing advances uh, that we'll dwell on a little bit uh, in, you know, in the course of our conversation that have really transformed uh, the treatment side of the equation. But, well, but it's, let's it's go to the free. screening for a second, because we just had, uh, I think about two hours ago, I was hosting a session on the overtreated American, where the question was, you know, uh, getting a PSA, yes, no. Getting a mammogram, yes, no. I actually had this morning a very dear friend in Boston who emails me and says, mammogram, uh, in my 40s, I've had one or two. Should I get any more? Um, and there's certainly at least controversy uh, about that. Um, so the, that issue, which like most issues, when viewed in isolation is what the problem is. You have to understand who is at risk for developing cancer. So understanding your genetic makeup, your behavioral activities that have put you in harm's way with respect to cancer incidents and so on is, is very important. Then those individuals that are at high risk should be enlisted into screening paradigms. So you think of uh, BRCA, the breast cancer gene, Angelina Jolie, the knowledge of that mutation can shepherd an individual to the right treatment paradigm or preventive paradigm for that individual. So part of it is about knowing who to screen. And we're, we're, we're not screening those that should be screened, and we're, we're, we're basically not in that sweet spot with respect to using our resources wisely there. But certainly the ha issue about mammogram is any woman walking in the door. Uh, having discovered that cancer, though, the issue is what do you do about it? So for, well, part of the issue is, should you get it? Should well, she get the, the if screening you, test? If you knew what to do with the information, which is what the issue is, the issue is not so much the detection part. The issue is the prognostication part. So the, and, and we uh, identify in prostate cancer as a result of PSA screening about 250,000 cases in the United States per year. Only about 30,000 men will go on to die of the disease. Yet we subject tens of thousands of men to radical prostatectomies and high-dose radiation because having discovered the prostate cancer, we're not really sure which prostate cancer is hardwired for badness and will kill you, or which ones are going to be benign, indolent, and you'll end up dying of old age. 
So for me, the issue is not just the screening part. That has to be coupled with a knowledge of the tumor biology of that tumor. And there's where we've had some advances. So in the case of breast cancer, there's a test now with early stage cancers that might shepherd you towards certain treatment paradigms or no treatment at all because you have an inherently benign cancer as opposed to a bad actor. In the context of prostate cancer, there are several tests coming out this year, possibly next, that look very interesting that might allow us to say, you know, you've got prostate cancer, but it is relatively benign, and we're just going to watch and wait and see how that prostate cancer progresses, and we'll biopsy you over time serially, and you may not need to undergo a prostatectomy and so on and incur the issues that relate to the morbidity I, I, I don't want to be a that. skeptic, but I can't control myself. But that's your job. Uh, that is my job. Uh, but uh, the critical word in your uh, sentences there was might. And one of the problems, certainly, uh, that I've seen as an oncologist is, yeah, well, it might do that, and it we just don't know whether if you got all those genetic tests for after you got your breast cancer, you really would, you know, if you got it removed, increase your likelihood of living longer, not having a recurrence. And I mean, we haven't really done a lot of those studies. And one of the problems, at least that I see, and love your reaction, is, you know, we released the PSA test onto the world. We got all these men tested, all these men diagnosed with prostate cancer, all these men got prostatectomy, and then we said, huh? You know what? It's actually not saving very many men's lives, maybe one in a thousand. Maybe this isn't such a great idea. Uh, and so the might always makes me nervous because we sort of release these tests before we actually know whether it's going to make a I, difference in life or death. So first of all, I, I hate to agree with you. Oh, <laughs> damn. But, I was um, trying to be the skeptic. <laughs> but, but the reality is that for most diagnostic tests to go out there, A, they don't fully address a critical unmet need. B, they're not... Uh, in, um, they are not highly validated to perform in a way that, that uh, you just spoke to. And three, they really don't do the economics. You know, we have a, a finite box of resources that we can expend as a nation on healthcare. We've got to use those resources wisely. And so not having them be spent on things that are not going to create value and simply quell anxiety one way or the other is not the approach that we need to be taking in healthcare. So until we can either erase the might one way or another, you would be a little hesitant. I, I think what's truly game changing right now is that uh, because we have this atlas, we have this periodic table for cancer where, you know, just a few years ago, we really only had a view of the tip of the iceberg. We know a lot about the genetics, underlying genetics of cancer. We're beginning to understand which genes are bad genes, which ones are really driving bad biology versus those that are just driving indolent growth and so on. With that knowledge and then the reduction to practice of that knowledge into a test that is well validated is what the future has to address because we as a nation cannot afford to deliver the type of healthcare we're delivering today. So let's just, uh talk again, be a little skeptical for a second. So we've now had the war on cancer exactly 41 years, right? 1972, Richard Nixon declared the war on cancer. And if I re recollect correctly, we, we certainly got kids, leukemias can be cured, testicular cancer, Hodgkin's disease, but a lot of the big killers, we certainly don't do a whole lot for lung cancer, breast cancer, you know, maybe in some cases we certainly can uh, uh, prolong the recurrence. Um, we haven't really hit a lot of other home runs, have we? Well, we have just recently, but you know, I think it's worth just taking a step back and asking an historical context here. You know, we're often asked, well, why, why aren't we, why aren't we cured this disease? We put so much of our nation's resources behind cancer research and so on. Let's just put it in perspective. In the 1960s, we there was a debate as to whether or not mutations of genes of cells were relevant for cancer. There was a Nobel Prize as a result of a discovery that was made in the mid-70s that, gee whiz, we have genes within us that might be cancer-causing. And then in the 1980s, we began to identify some of those genes. And now, as a result of the Human Cancer Genome Project, the most ambitious genome project in the history of life sciences, 
began in 2007, we now have close to the periodic table for cancer. So it's only until relatively recently that we actually knew what the genes were that drove cancer, but it's importantly, it's not just that that fills us with a certain level of optimism now and why we think that things are gonna accelerate at this point is that we also have advances in computational science at the same time, advances in nanotechnology which help us address the issues relating to diagnostics, advances in genetically engineered animal model systems that allow us to generate faithful models of the human disease and pressure test hypotheses, diagnostics, therapeutics, combinations to see if they elicit durable responses. But to me, the most exciting event just occurred last month in, uh, in the history of the field. For me, it's the, it's the biggest game changer since the uh, revolution of recombinant DNA technology. And this was at the ASCO meetings. Uh, an investigator who's now at MD Anderson, started his career as MD Anderson, went to Berkeley, then uh, Sloan Kettering, and now has returned to MD Anderson, asked the question in the 1990s, why is cancer not recognized as foreign? It's mutated, it should be abnormal, it should be recognized as foreign, our immune system should attack it, yet it's stealth. And he asked a very basic question, what turns on and off the immune system? We get a virus, our immune system gets revved up, but you don't want it to keep going. Once the virus is gone, you want to turn it off. So we asked the question, is there a break on the immune system? He discovered the break and then further asked, are cancer cells stepping on the break so that the immune system is quiet, asleep at the wheel, uh, and not recognizing it? So he developed a drug to deactivate that break. Uh, it's an antibody against uh, the, uh, the cells in the immune system. And melanoma patients uh, with advanced disease, these are patients with brain metastases, bone metastases, advanced disease, most would have succumbed within six months. 24% uh, of those patients are cured. The drug has only been around for seven years. And for those individuals, it's plateaued out. There's no evidence of the disease. And other drugs in this class are now coming online. So there are other breaks on the immune system. And the two uh, drugs against two different breaks on the immune system has now elicited what appears to be north of 50% Durable responses, we can't call a cure yet because we're not out at five years, the drugs have not existed, but it looks like they're durable responses for advanced melanoma, which was totally lethal just a few years ago. What's very exciting is that it's not just melanoma, there is signal of activity for some of these drugs in other major cancers, lung cancer, bladder cancer, so on and so forth. So, to me, that is the most game-changing advance on the therapeutic front. That is going to be coupled together with having uh, drugs that are more targeted, but equally important, it's to match the right drugs with the right patient, because every cancer is different. Every patient's cancer has a different constellation of alterations, and what you want to do is you want to use the right combination of drugs to be able to elicit durable responses for that patient. But for me, it's not targeted therapy that's the most exciting. It's reawakening, harnessing the power of the immune system that I think is the most significant advance in cancer since chemotherapy. And, uh, and we've had some recent uh, other studies showing that if you can transform T cells and cure people who weren't curable before. Yeah. And how long have we been working on the immune system to target cancer? Well, I'm just being the skeptic again. Yeah, no, uh, you know, it was recognized, actually with melanoma, that there were uh, these Lazarus results that occurred in, you know, one in a thousand uh, as a result of um, the immune system suddenly realizing they've got something that's not them and it's attacked. And ever since then, there has been a great interest in understanding how the immune system uh, can be exploited in order to elicit those responses more durably. It really wasn't until we began to actually understand the orchestrated events, the different types of cells in the immune system, and how the, the circuitry in those different cells work, what turns them on, what turns them off, until the last 10 years. 
and the first drugs in this class really came online, were first put into humans about 10 years ago. But we have tried interleukins, I mean, uh, all and, and, with the idea that we would turn the immune system on. And yeah, and we have, like, for example, in stage three melanoma, you go from, if you have a 5%, uh, you, you have a, um, in stage three, and, and correct me, but uh, I think it's 30, 30, 45% lethality for stage right. three, and if you have interleukin, which basically is you have the flu for five years, you get these shots, and you try to you know, wake up your immune system, that I would call is not targeted, not really going after that key circuitry that is defective, that gives you, I believe, a 38% survival. So you, go, you do go from 45 to 38, but you pay no the price, run. and it's not a home run. Okay. Now, you at MD Anderson have started this moonshot program, if I'm... Uh probably mangling the title. Why don't you tell us what the thinking is, what the program is and what the mm. thinking is behind it and where you expect to see successes? Well, the label of the moonshot is very deliberate. When you think about splitting the atom or going to the moon or the genome project, it was about a goal. It wasn't about studying something to try to then understand your next experiment or your next advance or your next drug, but it's to ask the question, you know, do we have knowledge today that if we were to fully deliver on that knowledge and reduce it to practice, would we drive mortality down? It's a very goal-oriented effort, very action-oriented effort. It's like, and then you soon realize when you have that kind of goal that you need cross-functional teams to come together to accomplish that goal. Think of splitting the atom if you only had Einstein's and theoretical physicists. You know, you needed the material scientists, the bomb makers and so on and so forth to be able to make that project move forward. So similar other large projects required cross-functional transdisciplinary teams to come together. So one aspect of this is to ask the question, are there, if we were to achieve a goal within a particular cancer based on knowledge today, would we accelerate declines in cancer mortality within the next five to 10 years? A. B, it had to um, be properly resourced. So if it costs hundreds of millions of dollars to execute that project, that's key. And typically what we do in science, however, is we have more of a Lilliputian approach to the issue. Uh, and occasionally those lead to breakthrough results and Nobel Prizes and so on, disruptive technologies. But it would be like, I'm from Texas now, so it'd be like um, if you wanted to drill for oil, you, know, you wouldn't give a thousand uh, geologists a shovel, right? you would need a platform, you would need a rig to really achieve that goal. So the other thing that we've done is we have, in addition to our scholars and clinicians at MD Anderson and, and our network around the world, we are also developing these professional platforms where we bring industry seasoned individuals, individuals knowledgeable in legislative affairs, individuals involved in education and in media to be able to launch these execution-oriented efforts uh, to attack these, these goals. And so in academia, it tends to celebrate the individual. It tends to be about discovery, not as much application and doing. The private sector, of course, does that, but they have their specific interests and motivations. When you think about what we should be doing in cancer in the area of prevention and screening and so on, those are things that the private sector may not be as interested in, but the government, as well as our academic institutions, I feel have a responsibility to push on that. So how many of these awards have you given? So we have, we went through a strategic planning exercise involving hundreds of investigators over about a six month period. We looked at cancers that represented about 90% of the cancer deaths. We selected about a half a dozen cancers that we felt that there was knowledge today that we could prosecute. And within each of those cancers, we have several projects that relate to prevention, screening, and uh, to uh, the treatment side of the equation. Uh, and they are, again, very goal-oriented, uh, execution well, So can you give us some resources. examples like in breast so, cancer? Uh, well, actually, you know, you talked about lung cancer. This, I think, from the screening, this will bring, it, I think, a lot of the points together. So we know today that uh, if you screen heavy smokers between the ages of 50 and 64 with spiral CT, you will reduce mortality by 20% just by shifting the cancer, catching them earlier in those individuals. 
So we know today that we could impact on tens of thousands of lives by just doing that. Well, we have 94 million former and current smokers. Let's just go ahead and screen them, math. right? <laughs> so they're economically not feasible. But as importantly, the other problem is that when you get a positive result, there's a 96% false positive rate. So for every 100, gee, I think I have something I have to worry about in this smoker, 96% of them are going to be tuberculosis, an old scar, some fungus infection, not cancer. So imagine the nightmare. You think prostate cancer was tough. Imagine the nightmare of having to do all these thoracotomies, biopsies, and so on. So we together thought of how is it that we'd be able to approach this problem. So it turns out that when we brought 200 people together to think about this problem, there were folks that were working in our prevention sciences group that had discovered a risk model that can identify individuals. And it has a p-value of infinity. At this point, it needs to be validated. But if that proves to but, be uh, by valid. By the way, well, uh, yeah. less than infinity, one over infinity, yeah. presumably. Small yeah. number. Good. One, one out of 1,000 off. It, it looks very good because it's uh, we could talk about the basis of the test. But, but instead of screening out 94 million smokers, you would be instead screening a few million that have this high risk model. You'd enlist them into spiral CT. And we are working a lot, and we in the field are working a lot on trying to refine how to interpret the images so we can reduce the false positive rate. So another investigator who normally doesn't talk to the others in a different field said, I've got a blood test. I've got six proteins that my preliminary results show that I can detect lung cancer a year and a half to two years before onset of symptoms. And so now you're, now you're thinking, well, I've got this blood test. I've got this risk model. And I've got this advances in spiral CT. If you were to actually orchestrate and bring those trans group, transdisciplinary group together, and importantly, develop the diagnostics so you validate them properly, you do the pharmacoeconomic analysis, you do the risk model, what's the risk and benefit ratio of anything that you do. But it's about, I want to achieve the goal of being able to detect lung cancer earlier for those that have smoked. That's the goal, and you soon realize you need all of those different disciplines coming together, and they have to be resourced to be able to do this. This is a multi-hundred million dollar initiative that spans now from China to Germany to South America and parts of the United States. And how many of these projects have you undertaken? So we have uh, about 15 what we call flagship projects in each of the different cancers that speak to different aspects of the prevention, the detection, and the treatment. We're pushing very hard on the early detection, uh, which I think is the lowest of the low-hanging fruit. That has to be coupled with the prognostication part of it, so you don't discover these cancers and then run into even more problems. Uh, so we're working very hard on that. And the treatment paradigms for those may be different. They may, we may be able to use therapies that would block those cancers from progressing more effectively and so on that would be more benign, more cost effective and so, so on. I, I, before we turn to the audience for questions, I want to ask you about uh, this issue, which you've mentioned, hinted at, but uh, uh, sort of elaborated, because I think it is one of these things which a lot of people in the find hard to get your head around. So a lot of us actually have cancer growing in us, but it never blows up into cancer uh, that might be life threatening. Uh, what should we think about that? And does it really mean that we shouldn't be so hysterical about every time someone gets cancer? Well, we, I would say that the vast majority in this room have resident cancer in them. Um, I would say that there, I would be, it would be a minority, uh, maybe a dozen or two of this nice sized group here. So the, the issue is, why don't they progress? When you are born a cancer, it's, there's a big bang of change that occurs that gives you a constellation of alterations that endow you with the ability to become a growth. But the type of growth that you become uh, may be very different depending on the type of alterations that you get. So it gets back to you know, whether or not you've got your hardwired to be bad or not. So just because you have a cancer 
uh, doesn't mean that you're going to die from that disease. It may be indolent within you for many, many years. However, it, there are many things that we can do that can impact on the circuitry of those uh, cancers as well as uh, the aspiring cancer cells within us that we can control that really directly impinges on this molecular circuitry that drives aging and age-related diseases. And it's the stuff your, your mother told you when you were growing up. Uh, and there, in my view, there are really uh, three, aside from smoking, there, there are really three major, major instigators of cancer uh, that we can uh, control. One is our nutritional status. Uh, and a proper energy balance, the types of stuff that you eat, and I'm talking about a balanced diet, I'm not talking about fad diets, you know, so that you have a reasonable body mass index is very, very important. So starvation diets, you're you know, not those into. the extremes, you know, our bodies, you know, have evolved over, you know, many millennia, and those uh, that those kinds of uh, uh, disruptions in your physiology are not, uh, I think, in your best interest. The the other uh, category is exercise. There was a study at MD Anderson performed in collaboration with the Nation of Taiwan, which has a really very sophisticated uh, health monitoring system, where just 15 minutes of exercise per day as a single intervention could increase your life expectancy by three to five years and reduce the incidence of chronic age-related diseases by 14%. So if you do more than that, 30 minutes, then you actually get more benefit. But as a, nobody has an excuse not to do 15 minutes of exercise. <laughs> That's the importance of that study. And then the last is stress. Everybody talks about, oh, I'm under so much stress and so on. There's different types of stress. Stress is good for you. Acute stress, like exercise, like this interview, is good for you. <laughs> but, Not very stressful for me. <laughs> but chronic, unrelenting stress of the type that you, know, you might have if you're a parent of a child with a psychiatric illness. Uh, or somebody that's going through a chronic illness and really having a hard time and so on. That level of stress needs to be dealt with very aggressively because that will chew up your telomeres, will cause so much damage in your cells and your physiology that it will accelerate aging and accelerate age-related diseases. So to prevent cancer, you need to fire across that beachfront. If you've had cancer, like breast cancer, for example, it's well known that if you take care of yourself, it's not just your doc, it's not just the medicines we give you, you have to be an active partner in the process. And if you take control of your health and well-being, you'll reduce the incidence of recurrence of that disease quite dramatically. Uh, so now we transform to your side of the equation, so we'll take uh, audience questions. Right over there. Wait for the microphone to come to you. Tell us who you are. My name is John Mason. The question is about myeloproliferative neoplasm. You spoke of new therapies that uh, are interdicting with myeloma. Uh, are you talking about MDS? We didn't hear you. you myeloproliferative disease. Myeloproliferative yeah. neoplasm. They yeah. just changed the name from yeah. polyvariscythema. But uh, you're talking about new therapies. Are those new therapies being tested? You, you got to hold it, okay. not just yeah, I, can it. I can repeat the question. So the question is, there is, uh, especially as folks age, what MDS so there is a, there's a disease of your bone marrow of a particular type of the immune cells that you have, the, white, the, the, uh, the blood cells, that um, undergo aberrations in their growth, and they become imbalanced. You refer to polycythemia vera, which is one component of, the, of those blood cells in the bone marrow. And what happens over time is that you get these um, growth imbalances in this compartment of your immune system that eventually ends up causing problems because you can't make as good blood cells, red blood cells. You can't fight infections as well. Your blood system doesn't work as effectively. And importantly, that disease can transform into a very lethal cancer called acute myelogenous leukemia. So there have been major advances in targeted therapies for a subset of these cancers, which have shown extremely promising results. But one of the things that has been uh, most significant in this area that you may be familiar with 
are the advances in stem cell transplant, where you use this ablative therapy to wipe out the, uh, the cells and then reconstitute it with uh, normal stem cells. And that, coupled with the targeted therapy, has given significant um, opportunities for reduction of mortality uh, in this space. In fact, a MDS AML uh, was one of the cancer moonshots that we selected because of the accelerating advances that are occurring in that disease, both on the transplant side and on the well, therapeutic just, side. Just, How, just sir, briefly. sir, we have many people who want questions. You got your one. Over here, the I'll pink I'll shirt. Stick around, I'll stick around and I'll, I'll answer We're your We're rationing questions here. Stand Thanks. up. I'm Linda Tischler from Fast Company Magazine. I'm very interested in the topic of data sharing. Yes. Um, you referenced that the academic model previously celebrated discovery, and that meant hoarding your data so you could be the first one to yeah. publish. With the, now that we can sequence the human genome at much less cost, we have an enormous amount of data. But does MD Anderson share with Dana-Farber and with Sloan Kettering? How is how's that working among you to accelerate uh, research does, and Th thank you for asking the question. This is extremely important, and I was actually the co-chair of the advisory board that started the Human Cancer Genome Project, and we established rules for that kind of project and other types of project that relate to data. And these are data sets that are um, there's a window of time so that the investigators who've you know spent their lives working on this get access to the raw early data. It's actually called the Fort Lauderdale Guidelines and Principles because I had a big meeting in Fort Lauderdale <laughs> uh, to, to, to establish the rules for this. And then, uh, and then it's released into the public domain. And so what you're seeing with ASCO, with MD Anderson, with other institutions, they're putting these data into the public domain. Um, one of the very exciting platforms that MD Anderson is embarking on, and I think it's going to be game changing because we have seen more patients than anyone. We have an enormous data set. We saw 115,000 patients last year alone. Uh, so we see a lot. We put 11,000 patients on clinical trials. A third of the FDA-approved drugs in the last five years were led by MD Anderson. So we have a lot of data that's extremely important to get out in the public domain. So what we've just done is we've created a data warehouse to ingest data. We will soon announce uh, this platform so we've seen over a million patients since 1944. This data set is going to have a million patients. It's going to have all the structured data. We're using natural language processing to ingest those data still further. That is being interfaced with big data, which is what a lot of people are talking about these days. Big data is essentially world information to interface with those patient data. And then what's most exciting in my mind is the ability to exploit for the first time cognitive computing. So you might know about uh, Watson, IBM, uh, third generation cognitive computing. What that allows you to do is to take that sea of information and ask and have the computer learn from the great oncologists as to how they would treat that patient. And then the machine actually learns as a result of that. And you develop the best evidence-based strategy based on the experts so that we can democratize the care of MD Anderson and other great cancer centers around the world and other parts, because not everybody can come to our medical centers. And so this is going to be game changing. Uh, some of these platforms have already passed the medical boards. I believe that this, uh, when we get into the next generation of cognitive computing, it's going to be able to outperform the human brain, I think that this is decision support. This, this is contextual thinking. Uh, and this, I think, is truly game changing, where it learns. I don't know if you remember the Watson Jeopardy. So there was the first, there was the first, um, the fir the first question, or the category was, I dig chicks. So the computer didn't really understand the context. Uh, does it mean you know you dig with a shovel, or is it a, is it a baby hen, or or is it you know or is it gals, right? The first contestant answered the question, and then Watson cleared the rest of the column because it understood the context. So it's a system that learned in in silico, and I think that that is a system that never forgets, and it's going to incorporate all the knowledge that we have to be able to best treat patients. Because that's what we need. What drives cost in the system is really we're not 
using the best evidence-based strategy to acquire the best outcomes in the most cost-effective way for the patient. But and so this is going to be key. I mean, I think it's important to recognize that there are a lot of steps between there, now and there. One of them is, you know, we actually have to get this information electronically in a format that can be shared across institutions. And one of the problems we have is that not all of those electronic health records want to be shared. The companies that produce the electronic health records have an interest in not having them so easily shared. And then I think, as, as uh, Ron said, one of the other really important things is going to be this natural language processing, because a lot of the notes we have are not in a format that's just digital, uh, and it's, uh, you know, human voices speaking in, and that, obviously, there's been huge advances there, but we're going to need a lot more, um, and then, obviously, combining the total amount. Um, so one needs to, I think, be, uh, there's no doubt that's going to happen, but you need to be reasonable about what the time scale is. It's not going to happen next year. It's the kind of thing that, by the end of the decade, uh, will probably really begin to come on, I think, in a major, major way. But we also should recognize that that would have never happened without electronic health records and forcing the healthcare system to adopt them. You know, we've had electronic health records. Doctors were not, and hospitals especially, were not so eager to implement them without financial incentives from the federal uh, government. Now, there is a huge uptake, and that will be transformative, but not tomorrow, not just next year. I would, I, you know, I just want to take issue with that. Uh, good, I, I'm glad. I think that... You've been so agreeable here, Ron. <laughs> I, you know, I think that uh, the, the, the comment by the end of the decade, maybe for wide-scale application and so on across our entire medical system, but what, will you, what you will see pretty quickly, and because there's, the economics is going to drive this, because you really want to have evidence-based strategies, so everybody's aligned with respect to this, the patients, the providers, the payers, and so on. And that is going to drive a lot of these in silico methodologies, or even in clinical research, to know which patients should go on which clinical trials. Right now, we have legions of research nurses plowing through charts to see if a patient can go on a particular clinical trial. The platform that I just described by uh, Q4 of this year at MD Anderson, we anticipate in our flagship leukemia program uh, that we are going to be able to do that automatically, which is about 50 research nurses worth of work per year. Other questions? There. Yeah. You. You got the gold card. I'm Barbara Furman. We t you spoke in the hold, last... Hold it up and don't wave it. You spoke in the last session about Angelina Jolie and her family history and why she made that decision. What about males with the same history? Yes. Are there preventative things that they can do? Yes. Uh, you know, ma males with BRCA are at risk for the develop development of breast cancer and uh, increased risk of other types of cancer. And so if you have that mutation in your family, and in fact... One of the flagship Moonshot projects is to develop the platforms to be able to identify a cohort of individuals across a very complicated family tree to get at individuals to know what their risks are if you develop, you know. So it's, it sounds easy to, oh, I'm going to tell my brothers and sisters and my cousins. It's to be able to develop a strategy to be able to go in there and look and to see if you're at risk and you carry some of these dominant alleles, which account for about 10% of the cancers, the genetic, strong genetic predis predisposing. Those are things that we can identify those individuals if we had the right kinds of in silico healthcare platforms that allow us to do that. And we're going to try to figure that out in the context of our women's cancer moonshot, which is one of the other moonshots. But I would get genetic counseling if this, you have this, uh, if you have a loved one or a friend or whatever, you want to make sure you go to a medical center and get genetic counseling so you can interpret the information and get, uh, have the right kind of strategy for uh, getting, um, getting the right kind of treatment. So if I didn't defer to my boss, I, uh, former boss, I'd be I'm fired. I'm not your boss so. anymore. Peter Orzek, I, I'll give you two questions. You can answer either or both. Uh, the first one is most of the things you talked about, smoking, exercise, uh, nutrition, chronic stress, have a very steep socioeconomic gradient yes. associated with them. So I just wondered if you wanted to comment on uh, 
the evolution of cancer, basically, by socioeconomic status. Yeah, well, let me, let me answer that because that's such an important question. Okay, the second one's actually related. So the second one is about a half a percent of the population today uh, for new, newly born babies is either serogenically freezing cord blood or yeah. placenta cells. Yeah. Not, I guess my question is, do you think that's a sensible thing for parents yes. to be doing? Yes. Okay. And it's yeah. related to, obviously, that yes, one, half a percent say, is wealthy and, people. And increasingly many, you know, in, in our age group are, are mobilizing their stem cells and storing their stem cells. I think, you know, the, the amount of uh, work that's ongoing in stem cell biology, regenerative medicine, and so on, which is the ultimate science, is going to undergo significant advances over the next several decades. So it, I think it is worthy to store uh, your blood, uh, your child's uh, cord blood, and, um, and uh, think about it for yourself as well. With respect to uh, the disparities that exist within our nation and around the world, I think that uh, technology can play a major role in evening the play playing field to a certain extent. But when you think about nutrition, for example, you get these good food uh, deserts where you, you don't have access. You've got McDonald's, and you could see, you could map obesity, childhood obesity, in these lower socioeconomic situations. And, and you, that, that ground zero there is where you have the problem and so on. Or the risk of smoking. Virtually all adults who smoke started under the age of 20. Most of the kids who start have uh, you know, problems at home or psychiatric problems or have issues with respect to their socioeconomic status and so on. So I believe that the most significant advance that we can make in prevention is to make this, as a nation, a child care issue. I believe that if we were to make as a national priority K through 12 education and do what this nation did for traffic safety, where you get into a car and it's muscle memory. You don't have to tell a five-year-old in this whole country to put a seatbelt on. They automatically put it on. It's part of our culture. So what we need to do at that age is we've got to teach kids what good food is. The UK, I was talking to Tony Blair about this just a few months ago, the UK in kindergarten today has cooking classes. Kids should know that the food, good food does not grow on the McDonald's arches, that we have to take responsibility for teaching our kids at a young age how to take care of themselves. The other is sun safety. During childhood, sunburns dramatically increases melanoma later in life. Tanning booths, it, that's a carcinogen. No kid under the age of 18 should be allowed to go to a tanning booth. We tax them for right? a reason in the Affordable Care but Act. But what we should do as a nation is we should have a legislative ban, as we do with smoking, to prevent children under the age of 18 from getting buzzed. The average 17-year-old girl on her way to a prom has 25 tanning bed sessions. 11 episodes of tanning increases your incidence of melanoma by 85%. And as part of the cancer moonshot cancer control, the first thing that we did, and I'm very proud of this, is that Texas is the third state in the nation which now has a ban up to the age of 18 for tanning booths. And that, the rest of the nation has to follow suit. For those of you who have connections with other legislators, educate them because our kids don't know about UV. They don't know that they should be protecting themselves. And it's the same thing about smoking. We've got to make tobacco prevention, sun protection, and energy balance national priorities for this country because otherwise, our, the next generation and thereafter are going to be paying the price for us being asleep at the wheel. Can, uh, that was... I want to go back to the stem cell question because I'm not exactly sure I understood your answer. Why would you, uh, uh, given advances, uh, store your stem cells now and not just wait till uh, when you might need them? Well, stem cells are, well, the, the question is whether and, or not- And most of yeah. us won't need them, I yeah. take it. Uh, well, the question is whether or not you, you, you believe any of the advances in regenerative medicine that have occurred with injuries and so on. Uh, there are certain types of stem cells that you know about, mesenchymal stem cells, that have shown some pretty impressive results. There's lots of efforts currently underway 
to uh, embark on tissue engineering strategies that impact on uh, cardiac repair in the case of um, cardiac injury, ulcers in the case of decubitus ulcers, so on and so forth. The ability to mobilize stem cells in a state of compromised physiology is greatly diminished. So the time to get really good mobilization of stem cells is And you don't think we're going to be able to convert regular cells into stem cells uh, with the advance of science? I think that there, the, you know, what's called the IPS strategy, that is you take an advanced uh, differentiated cell and you make them embryonic to convert them into other things. That is, and the Nobel Prize was given out for that as well, that is truly game changing. And I believe that that may provide opportunities for the development of new tissue engineering or generative strategies. But uh, to take a somatic cell, bring it to a particular state, and then shepherd it to the right state, frankly, is a lot of hoops You believe that in science, but through. you're not sure there. I think that there are issues and things that we have to work out to say that these cells are, in fact, as pristine as they are. One of the things about stem cells that you're aware of is that stem cells have remarkable DNA repair capability. They actually have very good curator capabilities that keep that, those cells in a relatively privileged state relative to other cells of the body. So uh, you have to uh, recognize that not all cells are equal in their capacity to regenerate the system. So I believe that given the dramatic increase in MDS AML that's occurring across the nation, uh, with the changing demographics, uh, with the uh, further application of stem, stem cell technology across a broad swath of oncology diseases, cardiology, uh, musculoskeletal disorders. You know, if you can afford to get it, I would get it. Yeah, right here. I, I really appreciated your name, rank, and serial da number. Dave Dobbins. I'm the chief operating officer of Legacy. Um, I appreciated your thoughts on smoking, and, and I certainly agree with you that youth prevention of smoking is important. But now the FDA has regulatory authority over the cigarette, which, you know, one of the big cures for cancer would be to simply do away with it. I, I wonder if either of you have any thoughts on how the FDA should be exercising that authority. Well, the, ex the FDA, the new, the new rules are really, if you want to make a change in, uh, in tobacco products, then you need the FDA to weigh in on this and approve it, okay? It doesn't do anything for the existing, um, most sophisticated drug delivery mechanism that, that mankind has ever invented, which is the cigarette, that allows you to get very high levels of nicotine in your body and so on. So the issue really is, in my view, is the prevention side of the equation. Obviously, the cessation and so on. There are many things that we could be doing legislatively um, I was with Mayor Bloomberg the day that they raised the tobacco age to 21, which is very significant because, again, it's up to that 20 where you get the vast majority of lifelong customers. And so if you don't start smoking up to 20, it's rare that you start after the age of 20. Um, so there are things that we could be doing, like not showing the cigarettes. You know, when you, you, the sale of cigarettes in New York State now is behind an opaque, uh, you can't show them in plain sight. There are many things that we could be doing education-wise, so on and so forth. What we've learned in smoking is that it, it not, it's not one thing. It's not education. It's not raising the age. It's not increasing the taxes, so on and so forth. It's all of those things and you very significantly decrease uh, the incidence of usage. But the key, and we're not doing this, the key is for us to really get into kids' heads early before the tobacco industry does. Because all they need to do is to get kids to smoke a few cigarettes. A third of us have polymorphisms, uh, differences in our nicotinic receptor that within a few cigarettes, you become massively addicted. You have no choice but to continue to smoke. So that's the business model. Get the kids to start to smoke, and you've got a third of them. They're going to be lifelong customers. You sit back, and you then reap in the profits, and we as a society pay the price. Yeah, I, I think it is uh, something that we have recognized we actually can make a big difference on. We've you know, cut more than half the number of people who smoked 
uh, over 40 years. We've had a, uh, I think as Ron said, a multi-factorial uh, approach, not any one thing. Uh, we have, however, seen uh, a certain sort of self-satisfaction, I would say, uh, over time. We haven't raised the federal taxes on cigarettes for a long time, um, and I think we probably need to get back to focusing on this and driving the rates down. Um, one of the things that's always struck me is, for all of you who fly to Europe, you recognize, you know, they still have high, you know, 20s, 30s smoking rates, uh, but they're skinny. Uh, we flipped it around, you know, we're obese and we have a much lower smoking rate than almost anyone in the world. And uh, so we should recognize we can have success when we do adopt this multifactorial approach, uh, but we have sort of been plateauing for a while in this area and we need to renew uh, uh, the vigor with which we uh, address it. Sorry to dwell on this, but 19% of high school students in the United States smoke daily. And it's 19%. very hard to, I mean, I think one of the other thing is 70% of the people who smoke want to quit. Uh, so they're very, they recognize it's bad for them, they want to quit. And the, because of the addictive quality, the conversion rate is three to 5%. Uh, so that really means that even under the most optimistic circumstances, someone has to, you know, everyone has to try 20 times to get off cigarettes. I mean, it's unbelievably difficult. Uh, most of us in the audience couldn't do something where the success rate is one in 20 and keep doing it day after day. And so that really, I mean, I, I think as Ron has said, it, it, once they've started smoking, you know, game up. We're not gonna make a big dent. But one more. There, there is, I just, I'm sorry to dwell on this because it's just so important, but the CDC recommends a certain amount of money that we get from tobacco taxes recommends education and a variety of other strategies to prevent tobacco or to have cessation programs and so on. On average, most states are about so, 2% yeah. of the recommended CDC levels as to what, what the money that they should be putting to work to solve this problem. And we as a nation have to stand up and say this is not acceptable. Okay, last question in the back there. My, my name is David Kamenetsky. I'm with Mars Incorporated, the food company. I'd be interested uh, in your perspective on the relationship between the medical institutions, regulators, and the food industry on obesity, fighting cancer, and so on. I'm sorry, I didn't really, did you get the question? Yeah, what the relationship is between the medical uh, establishment, the food industry, and fighting obesity. Yeah. I, I would say that, uh, you know, we've made some advances in labeling food so that people at least now begin to understand what it is they're taking, and that was a game changing. Um, I think that we're a very, very long way away from having a coordinated ecosystem that is dealing with the energy imbalances that we have across our nation. We talked about tobacco. By 2020, obesity is expected to surpass tobacco as a major cause of cancer in the United States. It's a major instigator of cancer. So the issue with a lot of the food industry is that they're really, you know, they have their, they have to make a return to their investors, you know, the, the way that food is presented, et cetera. There has to be some level of responsibility that the industry has, and everybody has to work in unison, because if you don't, you're at a competitive disadvantage, and you're not going to be able to compete in the marketplace. So there has to be the government, regulators have to, impose some level of guidance here as to what's acceptable and have guidelines, guiding principles for the industry because we are eating ourselves to death and our kids are the ones that are paying the price. And then we've got to make it, uh, under, we have to get our population to take responsibility and to understand what they should be doing to control their own health and well-being as well. Education, education, education. So. Um, I think it's really important. Uh, when I worked uh, in the White House on the Affordable Care Act and health care reform, there was a simultaneous track, which was the First Lady's Let's Move initiative to focus on obesity. And you know, a lot of people didn't see these connected, but they're very much connected because the anti-obesity campaign was to change childhood obesity in a generation, recognizing that you're not going to do it overnight. We didn't get to this problem overnight, uh, and uh, we're not going to solve it overnight. Uh, but I think like smoking, first, that should give you hope that we can make a big 
big difference. Uh, second, it is going to be a multifactorial uh, response. The med schools and doctors, I think, are a very small part of that. It really is going to be much more public health. Just what we did in smoking. You know, social opprobrium, advertising, raising prices, uh, uh, getting it, uh, uh, diffusing food in, to areas where, good food where it's uh, present. I would take a little, uh, the sponsors are probably going to kill me now, but, you know, the cover of this week, uh, month's uh, Atlantic is about junk food being the solution uh, as opposed to eating well. I, I don't know. I, I, I'm a skeptic about that, and it strikes me as a, yes, the good thing is that all, all these big Big food manufacturers and processors are thinking how to make their stuff more healthy. But uh, the question is, is that going to be better than uh, eating your greens, your lettuce, and what mom and grandma told you were uh, there? Uh, somehow it seems to me that's the right approach. Thank you very much for a wonderful session. Thank Ron. That was great.